actual testimonials happening this evening. The first one being a woman named Rachel, who is a wildland firefighter from Ontario, who helped fight last year's catastrophic fires in Northern Ontario. The second being Etienne Eason, who is here with us today. Thank you, Etienne, who is a very brave 19-year-old student at Concordia University who bravely took action with Last Generation last month. And he's gonna tell us a little bit more about why he did it. We also have Laura from Last Generation Canada, who is going to be speaking about who Last Generation is, um, why nothing we have done up to this point has worked, the history of nonviolent direct action, and a plan to get involved. We also have a quick breakout group, uh, just to have time to discuss what we heard tonight and the journey that everyone had to come tonight's talk. Finally, followed by the most exciting portion, a uh, quick Q&A with Mr. John Viant. So again, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm very pleased to share that John Viant will be speaking for us tonight. I'm sure all of you have read his books and know a lot about him, but he is a Canadian author whose work has appeared in many different magazine articles. Um, and has written many different books, including The Golden Spruce, which dealt with the falling of the spruce in Haida Gwaii, and his last book being Fireweather, The Making of a Beast, which was a beautiful portrayal of the catastrophic wildfire that basically uh, burned down all of Fort Mac in 2016. So without further ado, I introduce to you Mr. John Bayant. Sorry, you're on mute. Forgive me. There we go. There we go. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, very good to be with you. Thanks for that introduction. Um, if you could just tell me about how long I have to speak. Uh, 20 minutes or 25 kind of a thing? So we have you slotted for 25, 30 minutes. Okay. All right. Sure. Okay. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia. And... Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the the genesis of fire weather, what kind of got me onto the fire 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 file. Uh, I haven't really written about it before uh, this book and um, where I see us going this summer. Uh, I'm not going to look too far into the future because that's above my pay grade. But um, uh, fire weather. Uh, occurred to me really the, the same day it occurred to a lot of people, you know, everybody else in the world was doing something uh, on May 3rd, 2016, um, when a fire intruded into the lives of uh, about 90,000 people in Fort McMurray, and, and they were all doing something else too. Uh, I mean, I think almost everybody involved really had other plans for that day than than fleeing a fire and what would become the the largest most rapid evacuation due to fire in modern times and that's what that's one of uh the fort mcmurray fires um grim uh claims to fame uh it's also the most expensive disaster in canadian history and um it was uh, it, it became a kind of textbook case of what I came to call 21st century fire uh, in, in my book, Fire Weather. And uh, what I started noticing as I looked at fire weather, uh, sorry, as I looked at uh, the Fort McMurray fire and then other fires that um, had burned in Canada uh, since 2000, the Chisholm fire of 2001, the Okanagan Park fire of 2003, the Slave Lake fire of 2011, um, there was a big fire in uh, Australia, Canberra, Australia in 2003 that generated a tornado. Uh, that was quite unusual. Um, and so I was, was looking at these and I realized uh, that fire appeared to be um, changing somewhat in its in its behavior and, and, and moving with greater speed, greater intensity. And so I, I didn't have um, really scientific data to support that. This was just looking at what these what these fires did. And obviously there are thousands of other fires occurring across the globe in any given year, but most of them fall within uh, kind of normal parameters. Uh, and what we're seeing now more recently is increasingly lethal fires 
uh, the fires in uh, Chile outside of Valparaiso, uh, the death toll. Um, I don't even know if you're aware of this fire. About 10 or 15 days ago, there was a really terrible wildfire that ran through some hilltop communities, not unlike the hilltop communities in Fort McMurray. Uh, I think the death toll now is, is around 200 people and they're still looking. They don't know. And now there's a whole nother wave of fires that are sweeping through that region. So, um, and then we had Lahaina and, and we had uh, Paradise, California and, and others. And all those came after Fort McMurray. So when you look back to 2016, it's really sort of a, almost a quaint time. Uh, I hate to put it that way, but it really was a more innocent time. And I think it's one reason the evacuation was called late uh, in that case. Um, but so there's a, there's a term that we all need to know. One, one of the struggles I think that we have as people trying to respond to this, this new and very dynamic climate is developing a language for it. And, you know, people are tossing around this term called the new normal, uh, which I really object to. Uh, there's nothing normal about it. And, and new normal implies kind of achieving a new plateau. You know, we'll, we'll just find a new equilibrium and then there will be in the new normal. And in fact, what one of the signatures of 21st century fire, but also 21st century weather are kind of these whipsawing extremes. And we, we've all been through it. We've seen this weird winter we've had. Uh, if you're out here in BC, you've seen what's happened to the grape crop, the wine grape crop, half a billion dollar crop of grapes uh, in this very famous wine growing region, the Okanagan. Um, those buds were frozen in a kind of flash freeze after they'd begun to grow. And um, there's, I don't know what the fate of, of this year's wine crop will be, but it's greatly reduced. Uh, I don't know if it's 80% or, or how much, but it's essentially catastrophic for a lot of farmers. And uh, so that's just one example of these. And, and, you know, that would be a freak incident, except things like that are happening all over the place now um, in different seasons. So, so these, these extremes are anything but normal. They're certainly, they're, they are new. What's new about them is their frequency and intensity. You can always, you can go back in history and you find, well, we had the bad freeze of 1933 and we had the terrible uh, drought of, of 1917. And that's all true. What's happening now is this kind of cascade effect of, of, of multiple events like this uh, that are bigger, longer, more intense. Fort McMurray is a kind of, again, why I wrote a book about it is because it's a textbook example that, that brings to bear a lot of these trends and characteristics that mark our weather now. And the fact that it was in a petroleum town was kind of an amazing sort of, it's like, I think I kept thinking of Ouroboros, you know, the serpent swallowing its own tail. And, you know, for the past 150 years, we've been on this fossil fuel binge, petroleum and coal driven, that has empowered us in ways uh, that are that we that humans have never experienced before. You know, I, I, a term I use in the book is you know we've become casual wizards. You know, I can just walk across my kitchen now and fire up the stove. I can fire up the furnace. I can go get in my car. I can fill the house with with thousands of watts of of electric light, all just with turns of dials and flips of switch. Some of you can probably do it from your phone. Um, this is this is power that kings and queens and pharaohs and empresses never could have wielded. You know, it would have taken hundreds of enslaved people and draft animals to come anywhere close to the kind of power that ordinary citizens now in Canada wield without a thought. And the without a thought is significant because uh, we, we need to start thinking about it. Um, Fort McMurray, uh, uh, caught fire, and I need to offer a little corrective there, the, the whole city did not burn. The city was overrun by fire. It was disinhabited for a month, um, which is puts it in, a, in a, a very rare company with New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. There's really no other North American cities besides uh, 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 New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and Fort McMurray after the fire in 2016 that were disinhabited completely for so long. 
And so you really got a sense of this kind of dystopian, post-human urban situation. Super weird to spend time in it. And, it, and I explore that in the book through the eyes of the firefighters uh, who were there patrolling and trying to keep the fire from continuing to devour more neighborhoods, which it kept trying to do, not just for days, but literally for weeks. Um, one reason it got the name The Beast is because it kept coming back. But there were these uh, conditions uh, that ordinary citizens might not really notice, but that weather, particularly fire, really does notice. And so all of us have experienced a hot day. All of us have experienced a, a dry, low humidity day. But when you're in the Alberta boreal, the subarctic, uh, and there are frozen lakes uh, in the countryside and car-sized blocks of ice on the main river through town, the Athabasca, and then the temperature whips up to 33 Celsius and the humidity drops to uh, 12 or even 11 percent, you change the dynamics. And I think a lot of people that thought, you know, sit ordinary citizens understandably thought summer's arrived early. I'm going to wear shorts today. That's literally what some people thought about May 3rd, 2016, even though there was a massive fire plume about seven or eight or 10 kilometers southwest of town. There were several other fires also burning around the city that had started that very dry weekend. And you know what most of them didn't know is that El we were the North Pacific was in uh, the second year of an El Nino, just as we are right now. Sec the second year of an El Nino is typically drier. Um, and Alberta had had alarmingly low snowpack for two years in a row, just like we've just had out here. Uh, it's, you, I understand the winter back east has also been really wonky and strangely warm. Um, so, uh, so you have these conditions that are sort of priming the landscape. You don't, you have lower water. And then you also have, if you, when you start really looking at the history of, of rainfall and temperature, in Western Canada, you have this steady warming and also a steady decrease in precipitation. So it's incremental and you would never notice it particularly year over year. But when you look at the trend, when you graph it, you really see, wow, we're in a different place than we were in 1990. It's drier and it's warmer and there's measurably more CO2 and methane. And, and there's been a lot of that in the news. But when you're going about your life and you're especially you know, in an industrial town that is invested in not really being dialed in to the changes in climate, especially changes in climate that your industry may pay a role, play a role in, uh, it's either, easier just to kind of keep your mind on the job at hand, which is rendering bitumen out of the ground. And as you, I'm sure you know, it's not oil. They're drilling up there. They are mining bitumen, which is a tar-like substance soaked into sand that requires literally billions of cubic feet of natural gas burned every single day simply to render it out of the sand into a liquid. Then you got to heat it again to turn it into something that a petroleum company south of the border in the States will recognize and that their refineries can handle. So already you have this super labor intens intensive, energy intensive, land intensive, water intensive product um, that has already generated huge amounts of CO2 and methane, and it's not even usable yet. It's barely saleable. So it's a very unusual industry up there, kind of uniquely Canadian, you know, for all the wrong reasons, I would suggest. Um, back to May 3rd, 2016, um, You've got this incredibly low humidity, this uh, unusually high temperature. You know, if you go back through the historical record, you can find precedents scattered throughout the year, but never on the same day like that. It shattered that May 3rd heat record by, I don't know, six or seven degrees Celsius. It blew through it. And again, that's another thing that we see are these, these extreme violations of previous notions of stability. And that's really one of the hallmarks. You know, normally, if you're going to break uh, a temperature record, you know, it'll be by a half a degree or by a degree. You don't blow through it by 
five or 10 degrees as, been, as has been happening a lot, especially at the higher latitudes where all these extremes are felt more keenly, though that is, uh, even that is changing. So uh, what I learned to do uh, with the help of fire scientists and firefighters is to think about these conditions through, you know, not the eyes, but through the reactions of combustion, of fire. And so if you're fire, a person sees the low humidity and the high, uh, high temperatures. Oh, you know, spring's come early. I'm going to dress differently. This is really great. I can, I can get my boat out. You know, I can get on my motorcycle. I can do whatever it is that I like to do in the warm weather. Fire is that's now out on the landscape is noticing, wow, the humidity is incredibly low, which means I don't have as much work to do. Because fire can't burn if there's moisture in the fuel. It has to, that's, that's what the heat is for, is to evaporate all the moisture out. And then the heat, the second role of the heat is to heat the fuel up enough. Doesn't matter if it's a car tire or uh, a pool of kerosene or a black spruce tree. It needs to heat it up enough so that it begins to vaporize. And it's the vapor uh, just the same way, you know, you and I breathe air, you know, if you gave us oxygen in a liquid form, we, we couldn't do anything with it. We need to breathe it in. Fire, too, needs to engage with vapor in order to be able to grow. That's what feeds it. So if you throw a log on the fire, it's not the log that's burning. The heat in the fire heats the log up until it starts to off gas the uh, hydrocarbons. And so I'm I'm telling you this because we need to understand what fire needs, what it likes, what it responds to. And the wildfire burning southwest of Fort McMurray on May 3rd, uh, even though it was identified early, they had hotshot crews and Bambi buckets from a helicopter dumping water on it almost immediately. And it was so hot and so dry and also windy that the fire, they could not subdue it. But it was still many kilometers outside of town. We got this, you know, we'll get water bombers in there. We'll get some crews to dig fire line. We'll get some bulldozers. They did all that. They did all the normal, the normal things you would do to fight a fire of that kind that was relatively near a settled area. So on the one hand, they did everything right. But the way climate works now, um, there's this term that I want to introduce you to, uh, Forgive me if I did already. I gave a talk earlier today that the, the term is discontinuity. And Alex Steffen, a futurist uh, out of Berkeley, California, I believe coined it. And it, it basically talks about the discontinuity is when past experience ceases to be useful in dealing with present and future um, issues and challenges. And so the very capable firefighters, municipal and forest, uh, approach this fire as they had the fires before, 1990s fires, early 2000s fires. And what they had on their hands and did not realize was a different animal, a fire with different capabilities. So they, they brought in the bombers, they brought, they dug the fire line. And, but this fire, because it was now dealing with 11% humidity, um, it, that meant it could drop an ember almost anywhere and it would ignite. And normally, like if in my yard right now, if a bunch of embers fell in, they would be sizzling in the damp spring ground, even if they landed on my deck. I have a wooden deck. It, it's I would need to keep an eye on it, but it, it's unlikely that they would catch. But when it's that dry and also that hot, and it's been hot and dry for days and weeks, um, uh, it's a different if it's a different thing altogether. And so you have this fire that now has grown to be several kilometers wide. And because it's so dry and because it's so hot, it's up into the crowns of the trees. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that the boreal forest, a lot of Canada is flammable landscape anyway. Fire is natural to have on the landscape. One of the reasons we have the issues we have today is because we've suppressed so much natural fire. Now we have this buildup. And you take that buildup of, of lower fuels along with heat, along with humidity, and you get a really quite explosive 
uh, situation. And that's what we saw outside of Port McMurray. So um, these the flames in these trees, in these crowning uh, trees were you know, 50 meters, 100, 100 meters tall. And again, you think of these clouds of, and, you, and you've seen uh, footage of it, these huge eruptions. Firefighters actually call them dragons, these eruptions of, of flaming gas coming out of the forest. You know, that has nothing to do with methane or petroleum development. This is the tree's energy. These are the hydrocarbons in the trees re being released uh, at great intensity. And so there's, um, uh, this feels like a science lesson, but this is this is how our world is now, and we really need to understand it, or I, I, I believe we do. Uh, the radiant heat coming out of this giant wall of flame, uh, radiant heat is, is the heat that tells you not to touch the candle. So it's not the fire itself, it's the heat coming off it. The heat coming off of that fire was 500 Celsius and it's projecting outward and radiant heat moves at the speed of light. So you got 500 Celsius heat. 500 Celsius is hotter than the planet Venus. It's another world. And now that heat is in backyards with swing sets and kids' bikes and gas grills and dog runs. And, and so um, what surprised people and what surprises almost everybody dealing with 21st century fire is they're looking at the fire out there that may still be on the other side of the river. It may still be on the other side of the road. It may still be a mile out of town. But the embers are what does the damage. And so one way to think about it is a, a kind of medieval warfare type situation where you have the soldiers, the firefighters are out on the line dealing with the fire. And so they're dealing with the fire. We can all see them out there. We can see the planes coming in. We can see the fire. These guys, you know, these, these men and women have this, you know, these are pros, they got it under control. Meanwhile, the embers, the embers are like the archers in the trees hiding behind uh, the line. And they're sending these flaming arrows over the top of all the soldiers, over the top of all the firefighters, and they're landing actually behind us. And those are the wind-driven embers flying right over the top of us. And so when West Kelowna was burning last summer, I was tweeting to you know anyone who would listen, don't look at the flames, look at the wind. If the wind is blowing over you, the embers are too. And I did a piece for the New York Times op-ed uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, no, about a week ago about the Texas fires, which we can talk about if you want to. And, and, and th this is a real, this is a life-saving warning and something we need to be aware of. Don't get caught up and fascinated by the wall of flame that seems a safe distance away. Notice where the wind is. And honestly, it doesn't matter if you're in Ontario or BC anymore. It's, it, it's or New Newfoundland for that matter. It's all fair game at this point. And I, you know, I was there too. I remember thinking, well, I'm in BC. I live in a rainforest. That's a California problem. That's an Australia problem. And I didn't feel good about that, but I felt comfortable. And that changed for me in 2015. And then we had a really bad fire season in 2017. And now uh, we don't know if we have summer or smoke and fire season. We don't know what we're going to get. Uh, and can talk about that in a little bit. So you can see how um, these little tweaks in temperature and dryness um, influence fire, empower fire, enable fire, enable it to become something that we didn't really recognize. And there was just a piece released in Nature, you know, a very august, well-respected science journal by Canadian fire scientists about night burning, overnight burning, it's called. And it used to be wildfires would, would, would settle down. They wouldn't go out at night, but they would not rage and advance and expand. And that was another signature of the Fort McMurray fire was the way the fire did not, it didn't seem to care if it was day or night. And so not only is that, you know, extremely dangerous and gives the fire, you know, another eight hours of growing time in a given day, but it's also exhausting for firefighters who now have no respite. So a lot of firefighters in these new 21st century fires, they're working 24 hours, 
48 hours. They don't stop. These are duty bound professionals who are invested in keeping us safe and protecting infrastructure. And so they're, they keep going as long as the fire does. And it's, it's not safe um, and it's not humane. It's not physically possible. And you know it's amazing that nobody crashed a fire truck uh, in Fort McMurray, but um, amazingly, you know, nobody died in the flames of that fire, and that is a borderline miracle. And we've seen from Lahaina, we've seen from Valparaiso, from Reading, from Paradise, that people are dying. And we lost, I think, we lost nine, eight or nine firefighters in Canada just last summer, uh, and very nearly lost civilians lost animals uh but uh you know came within an ace of losing civilians uh so you know it's this is what it's come to um so this new world that we're in this new uh fire potential that we have uh requires us to really to look at the medium differently to look at our landscape differently to look at our homes differently and of course to scrutinize uh, sources of emissions, you know, and, and this is where, you know, Canada is a, is a standout laggard among G7 countries. So, you know, an amazing thing that has happened, uh, the UK, I'm going to, I'm going to stop now, uh, shortly. Um, the, um, I'll talk briefly about what's happening for this summer, but, um, just to give an idea, that, um, Canada's emissions have, have generally gone up. I think they're starting to, to tail off, whereas, other G7 countries, you know, Germany and the US and France and the UK have been dropping for the past 10 or 15 years. The UK per capita emissions are now down to 1880s levels. That's an amazing achievement. And you can see the political problems and conservatism of the UK. They just went through Brexit, which was really traumatic. Um, they've had a, their, their economy is not doing great. They, they have a very conservative of government and in spite of all that they've been able to reduce their emissions in a dramatic fashion something canada has really chosen not to do and um that's uh i, I just think we need to that's helpful to show what is at least possible um as far as um this season you know we saw 2023 the worst fire season in canadian history um 18 million hectares of forest burned it generated 42 terawatts of raw energy. That's 42 trillion watts. Uh, the raw firepower coming out of the forests and homes of Fort Mc, uh, of uh, Canada last summer could have powered a city like Tokyo or, or New York for close to a year. Just an astounding amount of energy. You know, usually uh, this type of fire energy um, is measured in megawatts, but there was so much of it coming out of Canada that they they had to move to terawatts, which is a trillion watts. So as far as um, this year, we are going to see something very similar, potentially worse. Uh, we've had fires burning all the way through the winter in BC. There's around 50 fires burning right now in Alberta, uh, Texas, a big state, same size as Alberta, a fire prone state where winter fires are actually not uncommon, just had the biggest fire in its entire history about 10 days ago. Parts of that fire are still burning. A fire chief was killed uh, in, in those fires. Uh, and it was, I think it's around you know 1.5 million acres right now. It's about 800 or 700,000 hectares. A colossal, colossal fire. Towns are burned, a lot of cattle died. Uh, and, and this is really just the beginning uh, for for that part of the country of the US. And so it's also just the beginning for us. Uh, we're coming into the warm season. It's gonna be a hot one. Again, we're in the second year of El Nino and we have now seen Fort McMurray, we've seen Lytton, we've seen 2023, we've seen Yellowknife. Um, uh, and the concern that I have is it's a lot drier further east. So there have been wildfires in Minnesota. There have been fires in Michigan. Uh, that's right below Ontario uh, and Quebec. And uh, so southern, southeastern Canada, I would say, is at elevated risk for fire. And so again, 
these problems that we think of, well, that's a West Coast problem, that's a Southern problem. That's not our problem, it is our problem. And, and so that's um, a, a lot of what we're facing is not just a shift in climate, it, it also demands a, a, a shift in consciousness. And once we shift our consciousness, we can address a lot of this. And, you know, I am not a doomer. You know, I really believe in our ability to respond and adapt and mitigate and change. And uh, so I don't have a fatalistic view of the future. And uh, I have a realistic view, uh, I think, but um, we don't just have, we're not just gonna sit here and see towns continue to burn down. Um, but what we have to do is respect this new reality and understand what it means, understand what those embers can do, understand how susceptible our yards are, our gutters filled with leaves are. Those didn't used to be a liability, now they are. But you know, we are, we have to remember that we are a species that has come through every kind of catastrophe. And we are the survivors uh, of those people who've been through every kind of calamity that planet Earth and the evil genius of human beings can throw at us. And here we are together talking about it in what I hope is a proactive and positive way. Um, and I'm going to stop there. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, John. Um, that was so important. I think it's really hard to find real information about these fires. So many people think that Vancouver was, you know, shrouded in smoke 20, 30 years ago when that was just not the case. And myself, I'm out in Ontario, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners this evening are. And sometimes it's unfathomable for us to hear these stories because it's just not affecting us today. But like you said, it could affect us tomorrow and it could be in our backyard. And thank you so much for speaking. Um, next, I believe Rachel is here. She is a 22 year old that is currently enrolled at Carleton University. She was a wildland firefighter last season. Uh, here Rachel is and she's just gonna talk a little bit. Uh, John talked about the firefighters in Fort Mac and Rachel was graciously on the front lines last year. Thank you so much, Rachel. And is just gonna talk a little bit about her experience. You're muted if you're trying to speak, Rachel. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right, perfect. Um, yeah, so as she said, um, I'm 22. I'm going into my fourth year um, as a wildland firefighter in Ontario. Um, this will be my second year as a crew boss. Um, and yeah, with this upcoming year is going to be, like John mentioned, probably more extreme than it was last year. Um, and my base and most of the bases in Ontario have about half of the crews that we're supposed to be having. Um, it's with that many personnel, it's likely due to the fact that it's not only because we're not getting paid enough that we should, but it's also because this job is um, contractable. So it's only during the summer. Um, that means that most of our employees are students like myself, like university students. And as soon as we're done our degrees, we're done working within fire. So with the with less and less people working within wildland fire every year, we're getting less and less experienced firefighters attacking these ever growing fires in Canada. Um, not only does that put everyone at risk because of the because the fire is not being addressed but it's putting ourselves the firefighters as well at risk because we're getting very unexperienced workers um there was a news article that was posted that said um crew leaders should have about seven years experience 
to be able to properly um, instruct a crew and take care of the fire. But right now we're having crew leaders that have about four or five years experience. Um, you know, it's just this lack of people and the lack of pay, it's, it's putting everyone more at danger. And even last year, we had to have crews come up from Mexico and the United States to help us. And this year, with the amount of personnel that were down, it's very likely that a lot of these fires will not be addressed because we're not going to have the people. The people that are coming from Mexico and the United States will likely go to British Columbia and Alberta like they did last year. So, um, you know, like likely this summer, we're going to be here in the city in Toronto, Ottawa, Southern Ontario, even into the States, we're probably going to be experiencing a lot more smoke in the air. Um, and I just, I really, really hope that this, seeing the smoke makes more people aware of the changes that need to be done to address these growing fires. Um, that's really all I have to say. If anyone has any questions, I'd love to answer them. Uh, just a quick comment, Rachel. Last time when we were speaking, you just told me a little bit about how many personnel you had uh, fighting a 300,000 hectare fire. Maybe you just want to speak on that for a minute. Yeah, so um, last year we were on a about 300,000 hectare fire um, for the first couple of days. There was about two crews on that fire um, until we had enough personnel. But even then, with that kind of fire, it wasn't near any um, communities or anything. So they didn't feel the need to put any personnel or, you know, helicopters or anything like that on the fire. But even still, it just goes to show that the amount of shortages of crews that we have is putting us in so much danger. Rachel, how do they um, advertise for crews? Where do they, uh, where do your supervisors go looking for them? Um, I know um, locally, because I'm based out of a smaller town, I know locally they just post it on Facebook and mostly everyone is aware of it. Um, but yeah, there's not much recruiting that I personally know of um, in bigger areas. Um, but even still, recruitment is extremely hard because a lot of people um, don't want to have a job that's only in the summer, especially adults that aren't in school, um, yeah. and because of the lack of pay as well. Wow, that's... Um, mm. um, hi, sorry, Diane. We are going to be leaving questions to the end. Uh, don't worry, we are having a Q&A at the very end of the Zoom meeting. I am now, thank you so much, Rachel. I really appreciate that. Um, myself and a couple of other people within this Zoom call are tree planters or were tree planters and we were sharing helicopter pads with the wildland firefighters. And I still can't begin to imagine what you guys were experiencing because it was tough enough uh, planting near the fires, let alone actually fighting them. Um, I'm sure myself and everyone on this Zoom call, thank you so much for all of the hard work you do. And you are one of the main reasons that we're all here today because people like you and across Canada are just not getting the support they need. And we don't want this to become catastrophic for our homes, but for the people that are sacrificing their lives on the front lines as well. So thank you so much for speaking this evening, Rachel. I am now going to pass it off to Laura who is going to speak a little bit about last generation. Uh, do I have to unmute you? Okay, I think I did that. Great, um, thank you so much, Jill. And thank you everyone who's spoken tonight. Rachel, thank you so much for sharing. And I do really wanna thank you for all of your hard and brave work. Um, and thank you very much, John, for sharing your extensive knowledge on the changing landscape of these fires. Before I go any further, I just want to make a quick acknowledgement of the land that I'm on. I'm currently in Ginyakahaga territories, otherwise known in this in this space as Jukjage, um, formerly called or called to a lot of us Montreal. Um, and you know, it's been sunny temperatures. It's been pretty hot, 
everyone told me that when I moved over to Montreal, it would be the most miserable winter you've ever had, but it's been feeling a little bit more like I'm still on the coast. So just a little bit about myself. Um, I know that some of you might know me already. Uh, my name is Laura. And yes, I've been with this campaign since the very beginning. Um, I was arrested for putting pink paint on a woolly mammoth. I was arrested two times after that. I've been put on remand. I have been put under conditions um, brief or for a period of time where I wasn't allowed to speak to the media. I wasn't allowed to speak to anyone associated with this campaign. Um, I wasn't allowed, to, I'm still not allowed to enter into the city of Ottawa and all of these things simply for getting in the way of business as usual because we need to address the climate crisis and we need to address these fires. Um, you know, it's not like I really want to be here tonight talking to all of you um, about the actions that are required and are needed to, to be taken to secure a solvable future. You know, I, I studied engineering at UBC. Um, I wanted to go onto the technical side of these types of problems, but there are enough scientists that have been yelling at our government. There are enough engineers who have been developing uh, renewable energy infrastructure. There's enough people who could tell you what to do about the climate crisis, but our government is not doing enough and this has to be addressed. You know, I, I really wanna talk a, a, just a little bit about where the, these stresses are falling. Um, you know, Rachel just talked to us and, you know, she's in her early twenties, she's on the front lines of these fires and, and, you know, Jill and myself and a few others on this call have been planting trees up North. Our generation did not cause this crisis, but we are the ones who are trying to reforest, uh, this country. You know, we are the ones like Rachel and these firefighters are young. These are the people that are putting their bodies on the front line for this crisis. Um, you know, I was, I was speaking to someone uh, who knows a lot about safety in the tree planting world. And he told me that uh, he's waiting for the day where an entire camp of tree planters gets taken out by a fire. These are people that are my age you know, we're young, we don't have a future. And these are my some of my best friends that their lives are literally on the line right now. This is the effects of the climate crisis in 2024. Um, we're at 1.5 now, guys. You know, articles are coming out telling us we've been at 1.5 degrees for the past year. You know, this was the number that they said, do not go over this number. Do not do it. The IPCC was begging you know, we had all these conferences and all these commitments. Well, now we're here. It's time to freak out. Um, you know, I'm really not here uh, tonight to, to just talk about how bad the crisis is. I mean, John has really just given us a great overview about how bad things truly are. But I feel this need to frame what's coming down the line for us before I go in to the pathway to action. Because otherwise, without this grounding and without this framing, the pathway to action doesn't make sense, right? Why would you go sit in jail? Why would you go put yourself in risky situations um, in the streets? You know, why would you give up your whole life to organize for this? It doesn't make sense unless we look at the context and the true context. Um, you know, I've been organizing since 2019. And, you know, back then I was in it because I wanted my grandkids to have a livable future. I'm not going to have kids anymore. You know, now I'm in this fight because I don't want to see my parents get shot at the grocery store and we don't have food to eat anymore. You know, I don't want to see uh, my little brother drown in a flash flood. I don't want to see my sister get raped in the streets because we know that societal collapse is an inevitable result of this climate crisis. You know, our government right now is barely able to staff wildfire fighting services uh, to be able to tackle these impacts at 1.5 degrees of warming, what's this going to look like at two? What's this going to look like at 2.5? This is absolutely terrifying. But you know, we've seen these scientists, you know, tell us a conservative truth. Uh, we've seen politicians lie to us, telling us that things are happening when uh, fossil fuels are continued to be invested in, you know, 
we've been lied to on so many different fronts, but right now I want to talk about a really important lie uh, to debunk, maybe the most important one of all. And it's this lie that you right now are not powerful. It's a lie that you right now do not have the ability to change our course. You know, no one is going to save you. It's up to us right now to make that decision together ourselves to get ourselves out of this disaster. So, you know, I know John just talked about this uh, kind of concept of uh, discontinuity, this concept of not being able to, you know, use the same methods in a new in, in a new situation. So, you know, as activists, we've been signing petitions, we've been writing to our MPs, we've been going all of, you know, the non-disruptive routes for a very long time. Well, we can't keep doing this. It's not working. And we, we can see that by the fire season that we're looking towards. So, you know, before I dive into uh, why civil resistance works, um, I just also want to outline exactly what Last Generation Canada is fighting for. So first and foremost, Last Generation Canada is demanding a national firefighting agency that trains and employs 50,000 firefighters. This is a no brainer demand, you know, um, like I said, I'm just a 25 year old um, girl. Uh, I don't have the solutions to everything, but a national firefighting agency that trains and employs 50,000 firefighters is a no brainer. You know, um, we have right now 30,000 less wild firefighters than we did in that terrible 2016 Fort Mac season. Last season was like twice as bad as that Fort Mac season. And we have 30,000 left less than we did that season. It makes no sense. You know, and this demand that we've been putting forward, it's been it's it's been endorsed by the NDP. It's been endorsed by the Green Party. You know, this is not a controversial demand. We need more people on the front lines, um, you know, for their safety, for our safety, for everyone. But secondly, you know, this is a, that's our emergency demand. But secondly, we're also looking uh, to implement citizens assemblies as a legally binding citizens assemblies as a way to tackle the climate and ecological crisis. We cannot trust our current politicians that have done nothing year after year on this crisis. And we need ordinary people to be making decisions that are best reflective of what the public truly wants. Because right now our governments are protecting corporate and elite interests, not what is actually going to save us from this giant death project that is steamrolling towards us. So let's talk about civil resistance. How are we gonna get ourselves out of this disaster? Well, civil resistance works. And I wanna talk a little bit about Erica Chenoweth and her work. Erica Chenoweth, she's a political researcher at Harvard. It's very funny about Erica because, you know, she actually believed that violent action would be more uh, effective than nonviolent action. But when she actually sat down to do the research, looking at over 300 uprisings of the past 100 years, what she found is that nonviolence is twice as likely to succeed as violence. So empirically, nonviolence is more effective than violence. This kind of makes sense in, in, in a you know, philosophical or moral way as well. You know, the state is always gonna have more money, more weapons than we will. That's an absolute. But what we have as a group of ordinary people who are peaceful and nonviolent is we have the weapon of moral authority. This is something that us acting in the best interest of everyone, this is something that we have and, and we cannot lose. So essentially what Erica also found in her research is that no government can withstand an uprising of 3.5% of the population. That's no government can withstand this, this amount of people. It's actually not that big of a number. And when you take a look at some of last generation's actions, you know, you see a lot of hate. You see a lot of people um, getting outraged. You know, people are upset because we're blocking a road and they can't get to work. Uh, we don't take that lightly and we understand. But, you know, we're looking to get the most media possible to sound the alarm on the climate crisis, on the wildfires crisis, and reach that 3.5% of people who are actually willing to take action. 
So, you know, what Erica's work kind of looks like is she's found that a typical successful uprising is something like thousands of people going down to the nation's capital and engaging in sustained, nonviolent, peaceful disruption uh, for an extended period of time. This is what leads to success. Now, there's a lot of different examples that, you know, I could go into, um, you know, over civil resistance. There's, you know, the civil rights movement in the United States. You know, there's the suffragettes. You know, if it wasn't for people like the suffragettes, I'm not sure I'd be even able to speak with you all today in, in this meeting. You know, there's the Indian independence movement. There's the Serbian uprising. You know, there's countless examples across the world that have proven the efficacy of nonviolent civil resistance. But just for relevancy's sake, I'm just gonna dive deep into a more recent example. So essentially there's a group called Extinction Rebellion and I'm sure some of you here have heard about this group. But you know, Extinction Rebellion spread to a bunch of different countries, like over 60 different countries, I believe 200,000 people worldwide joined. So very cool, lots of stuff has been happening, but a very particular place in which this group was successful is the Netherlands. So the Netherlands started their XR chapter back in 2020, where seven people got arrested, um, you know, blocking some consulate office, just seven people. Seven people deciding together, hey, okay, we're gonna do something, um, you know, that gets that gets attention. Um, we're, we're small, but we're still going to take action. We're dedicated and we care about this. This is our future on the line. Well, from those seven people in 2020, you flash forward to 2023 and we saw a 27 day blockade of the A12 highway where there was 12,000 arrests made over this period. With Within a few days of this final blockade of the A12, the police were begging the government to meet their demands, their demand being to put an end to fossil fuel subsidies. You know, at the end of this blockade, this group achieved their demand and the Netherlands committed to putting an end to fossil fuel subsidies. Now, this is only one step of the way, but it shows small groups of people can iterate and iterate into massive groups of people that have a tangible difference. You know, um, Last Generation Canada is, you know, greater than, than just Last Generation Canada. We're part of an international network called the A22 Network. Now, this network hosts other campaigns like Just Stop Oil, um, like Let's A Generation in uh, Germany, in Italy, in France. We're in over 12 countries across the world. It's not just us here in Canada screaming for a livable future. There are people across the world who care about this too. And we've seen massive success. A lot of these campaigns have met regional demands. You know, a lot of these campaigns have thousands of active members. You know, these campaigns are in the international media time and time and time again, and we are following suit. So what is Last Generation Canada's plan for action? What, how are we going to do this? So, you know, we started this campaign as on to Ottawa, um, so we participated in our initial action phase at the end of last summer, and we just came out of actions in February. But our plan is essentially to continue to go into action phases in the capital, where we go down there, we disrupt business as usual, time and time and time again. We'll come back, we'll focus our efforts on recruitment, and then we'll return again and again and again until we win. You know, we now have chapters that are set up in Montreal, a chapter that's set up in Ottawa. So, you know, I always say this, but we're we're really not fucking around here. You know, we're playing this game to win. This is all of our futures that are on the line. And of course, um, you know, this requires immense sacrifice. This requires, you know, people willing to step outside of their comfort zone, to face consequences, to take time, to donate money. But we always talk about these consequences of action. What about the consequences of not doing anything? Why don't we talk about the consequences of not doing anything? So yeah, really, um, if you wanna get involved with last generation, there's quite a few pathways for you to join. Um, you know, if you're located in Ottawa or Montreal, the best thing for you to do would be to come to a training. 
Um, we're having these every second week and all of our events are listed on our website. So maybe Jill, you want to put that into the chat here. Um, so yeah, you can come to, you know, one of our trainings, um, that happen in Ottawa and Montreal. Um, this is a really great way to, you know, meet people from the, these local chapters and get engaged and ready to want to take action. Um, you can sign up to take action with us and Jill will also post the, the sign up form. Um, you know, if you're not able to take those risks, then you're also able to help us with the recruitment activities. We need help with online recruitment activities, like making a lot of phone calls, uh, but we also need help with in-person recruitment activities. We're postering, we're setting up talks, we're setting up trainings. We are building our communities as fast as possible. This wildfire season is coming very quickly down the line. And, you know, just like Rachel said, people are going to be waking up when their skies are filled with smoke. Uh, when their when their house is actually on fire, and we need to provide a nonviolent pathway for people to take meaningful action, and this is what we will do. So, yes, you can get involved with action. You can help us with recruitment, and you can donate. You know, we really need donations. You know, a lot of us, you know, with this campaign, have given up our entire lives to organize for our collective futures. These things cost money, and our opponents that sit at the top are very, very well-funded. You know, we're not, we need your help. You know, um, there are some uh, some action pathways, you know, if, if you're interested in learning more about this campaign, um, you know, yeah, there's lots more introductory talks. There's lots of trainings that you can come to. There's people that you can connect with. You know, everything right now is at stake our futures, our lives, our livelihoods. The way that we've been living life as we know it is coming to a quick end. We can't afford to lose this, everyone who's here tonight. You know, it's 2024. You're here, you're listening to maybe what you think is some crazy 25 year old tell you uh, what you should be doing about the climate crisis, but uh, you're existing right now in a short window before everything is lost. And to be existing on the edge of what could be the end of our species and the biggest mass death event that we've ever seen in this society, you have the power to do something. So I, I've told you what I've done. You know, I've told you the path that I've chosen. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just asking you, you know, to ask yourself, what can I really do um, in March 2024? Thanks very much, uh, everyone, for listening. And I'm going to pass it back to you, Joe. Thank you so much for your words, Laura. That was really inspirational and informative. Uh, like Laura said, so many of us are putting our own money, our own countless hours into this kind of work. And before we go into a breakout and a q and A, I'm just going to pass it over to Mr. Etienne Eason, who, um, you know, is one of the youngest people to take action with Last Generation and is facing extreme legal consequences right now. Uh, young people all over Canada are sounding the alarm on the climate crisis and like myself are willing to do anything it takes to actually have a future. Um, so many people say that we're sacrificing our future by getting arrested and doing radical things. But in my mind, uh, I don't have a future if I don't do these radical things. So. Uh, without further ado, I will pass it to Etienne, who I will unmute. Thank you so much, Jill, and thank you so much uh, to John, Rachel, and Laura for yeah, sharing all of your valuable insights on this issue. So yeah, hi, my name is Etienne. I'm a 19-year-old university student uh, studying creative writing uh, at Concordia University here in Montreal, where I'm joining you from. Uh, so yeah, I'm really like into writing poetry and short stories, and actually about uh, a year ago last spring, I had uh, you know, my first story get published, and that was just around about the same time that I uh, first learned about uh, Last Generation Canada, or as it was known back, way back in the day, uh, onto Ottawa. And honestly, when I first found out about it, um, I was extremely skeptical about the group. Um, I found it. I, I found out about it through my sister 
who'd been a part of it more or less since its inception. And I remember how she like showed me videos of what what they were getting up to. And, you know, it was like the 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 girl who uh disrupted the Junos and uh the throwing paint on the the Prime Minister's office. And I thought, you know, this is dumb. This is only like alienating people against the cause. It's like counterproductive and everything. Um so I was, you know, not not feeling solar resistance at that point in time. Uh, but then of course we had that, you know, historic wildfire season and, you know, we felt that wildfire smoke across the country and I definitely felt it uh, in Ottawa where I was at. And yeah, I just remember, you know, waking up in the mornings and drawing the blinds and looking up to, to find a sky, be this apocalyptic shade of orange. And, you know, I remember, you know, singing in church and there being like a a frog in my throat uh, trying to sing. I felt like a chain smoker. Um, yeah, so it was uh, pretty impactful to me. So it was pretty uh, serendipitous then that that very same summer, Antara would have its uh, very first action phase uh, in the capital. And as I said, I was really not into solar resistance at this point, and I would have never uh, considered coming to a talk, but it was my job to do so because I was working as the office administrator at my church. Um, so it was my job to unlock and lock up the church uh, where Onto Ottawa was giving a bunch of talks. So, you know, I thought that, you know, while, while I was there, I might as well, you know, sit in on these uh, talks uh, to, to, you know, pass the time. And, you know, after hearing the talk for maybe like the fifth time, I was pretty much, you know, convinced of just how serious the situation is right now, just how much we're risking by continuing on this reckless path and really how, you know, all other forms of protests that we've you know deployed so far have failed us uh and you know how how civil resistance has been really effective in the past uh so yeah since then i've been active in montreal with the uh team uh the mobilization team here in montreal uh giving talks and you know getting the word out um and yeah next thing i knew you know one day i was just you know uh uh you know poet in a as a church secretary in Ottawa next thing I knew uh this February I uh was in the Museum of Nature and I had a fire extinguisher filled with pink washable paint in my bag and I sprayed washable paint on a replica dinosaur skeleton and yeah you might be thinking like this is you know pretty radical uh, uh hosing down uh, a replica dinosaur uh but I think as Jill mentioned I think it's radical to not do anything I think it's radical uh, to be apathetic to this. Um, so yeah, I did get arrested for that and I did spend a night in prison. And, you know, it's 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 a pretty dark place to be when, you know, you're trying to do something for a little future. You know, I'm a student and, you know, every day I'm working away on a degree uh, that's supposed to prepare me for like the real world. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure if that world is waiting for me. Uh, on the other side. So it's pretty dark when, you know, I try to do something about it and I spend the night in prison. You might think that that's just going to, you know, reinforce my despair and, uh, you know, probably make me pretty cynical. Uh, but for me, it actually did the opposite. Uh, I would say that my uh, night in prison kind of restored my faith in humanity because uh, I was in a dorm of about 20 other inmates. And the moment I stepped into that dorm, I was just overcome by the kindness that I was shown by the other inmates. Uh, you know, I had like a TV dinner and two slices of like dry toast. One guy offered me peanut butter, another guy offered me jam, a third guy offered me an orange. Um, and then when it was time to go to bed, you know, I was on the top bunk of a bunk bed and the guy on the bottom bunk offered to make my bed for me. And I was like, oh no, it's fine, I'll, I'll deal with it. And then as I was making my bed, I was kind of like struggling at it. So this other inmate comes up and asks, you know, can I make your bed for you? And I, th this time I accepted. Um, and then he even came back like five minutes later as I was in bed to ask him, are you comfortable? Are you all right? Um, so just this incredible kindness from people, you know, who are in prison, who, who knows what they've been through in life, who knows what they've seen. Uh, but yet in that moment, they were able to put any of that aside and show me this incredible kindness. And I think that is truly the attitude that we need to be taking towards the climate crisis, this hopeful resilience in the darkest of times, even if that means making personal sacrifices. And, you know, right now I'm on a Zoom call with about, you know, 50 tiles in front of me. And it just fills me with so much hope to know that, you know, behind every 
every one of single one of those tiles, there's someone who cares enough about this that they, you know, took the time to talk about, you know, one of the most depressing topics to exist on earth. That just fills me with so much hope. And I hope it's a sign of greater things to come. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Etienne. I really appreciated that. Um, it's always so amazing to see how intergenerational this campaign is because the climate crisis doesn't affect one kind of person, it affects every single kind of person. Um, so next we are going to go into breakout rooms. There are not so many people to facilitate. So there are going to be four breakout rooms. So that's going to be about 10 to 15 people per room. So we are going to have to kind of keep it short. So we have time to wrap up and ask some important questions to Mr. Viant. So I am, um, I am going to be doing that, but just before, sorry, I am not very technologically savvy and I'm on a 2012 MacBook computer. So um, <laughs> it's a struggle. Um, like Laura said, uh, Last Generation Canada is only here today because of our amazing donors and people that have helped us along the way. Um, it would be amazing if the government would fund us. However, uh, we are, you know, not quite loved in the government's eyes and donations are really hard to come by. And in this kind of work, like everyone was saying, um, the fires are coming soon and the fires are coming fast and we need uh, all hands on deck before we have that. So usually we ask people graciously uh, to give an hour of their wages uh, per month to last generation. It would be absolutely amazing. Um, it's so important. Again, uh, we are not funded by big oil or the Canadian government, uh, like some people may think. So I'm just gonna put our donation link into the chat. Oh, I did that twice. Um, yeah, we really are running on blood, sweat, tears and small donations. So whether it be $2, whether it be $20, uh, I encourage my parents, uh, my birthday is tomorrow and I asked everyone to donate to Last Generation instead of giving me presents because the only present I can really hope for is a livable future. So I really urge you all to do the same thing and I am going to be putting all of us into breakout rooms where we are just going to do a quick go around about how we're feeling um, after this quite lengthy and heavy talk and what you want to do to take action in the future.